under siege in northern Mozambique. Nearly 200 people are trapped in a hotel after fighters linked to ISIL take over a town near major gas projects. Why is the government struggling to secure the area? And will outside intervention be needed? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. A hotel has become the latest flashpoint in a long-running conflict in northern Mozambique. ISIL-linked fighters besieged the town of Palma on Wednesday. That forced nearly 200 people to seek refuge in a resort. Many are foreign nationals working on a natural gas project owned by the French company Total. The firm had announced it was resuming operations just a few hours before the attack. Work has stopped again and Total has sent in vessels to rescue its employees. Reports say some civilians who tried to escape have been killed. Haru Mutasa is monitoring developments from Harare in neighboring Zimbabwe. What we know from official sources in Parma is that the attack happened on Wednesday afternoon. Armed groups entered the town from different directions. It seems the attack was coordinated. They attacked a bank, a business center, and what sounds like an army or police post. People in the town and a neighboring village fled into the bush. Uh, Mozambican VIPs and some foreigners are holed up in a hotel in Parma. We told some of them have been evacuated. The attack happened hours after the French company Total announced that it's resuming gas operations in the area. So some analysts are saying that perhaps this attack had something to do with that announcement. Another theory is that it had been quiet or relatively quiet in the area for some time. So humanitarian workers were now able to bring in food and medicines for the community. So there's a theory that these insurgents, these armed groups were targeting those supplies. The United States has said it's going to send its special forces to help train the Mozambican army. Portugal, the former colonial power, said it's also going to train the Mozambicans. South Africa, it's been reported, is also training the army as well. There are private armies in the area. They're mainly there to guard the gas installations, but they've been helping evacuating some of the people who've been stranded in certain areas in Parma. In terms of the region, re leaders in southern Africa in SADC have had meetings on and off, virtually and in person, to decide what to do to help Mozambique. All they've said is that there is a plan, but they haven't said what that plan is going to be. Security analysts are saying that if there's going to be some kind of military intervention, South Africa, which is the biggest economy in the region, people assume it has the equipment, could go in with a number of other countries in the region as well. The concern that humanitarian workers have is that, of course, any violence on the ground, any boots on the ground could affect the safety of people trying to run away from the fighting. Some of those people are trying to make their way to Pemba, the provincial capital, where they'll get food, clothing and medicines from humanitarian workers there. The government of Mozambique is trying to move those families who managed to reach Pemba, Pemba to other parts of the country that they believe is safer. Haru Mutasa for Inside Story. Palma lies more than 1,800 kilometers northeast of Maputo in Cabo Delgado province, and about 10 kilometers from the site of natural gas projects worth $60 billion. Fighters captured a key port close to that site in the town of Mosimba de Praia in August last year. A few months later, ISIL-linked fighters beheaded more than 50 people in a nearby village. The El Shabaab armed group in Mozambique has been intensifying raids across villages in Cabo Delgado since 2017. The violence has killed more than 1,500 people and displaced over 600,000. All right, let's bring in our guests. In Maputo, Zenaida Machado is senior researcher at Human Rights Watch. In Pretoria, Jasmine Opperman is senior researcher at the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project. Also in Maputo, Fernando Lima is a journalist and political commentator. Welcome to the program. Zenaida, let me start with you today. Tell us a bit about Al-Shabaab. How big is the armed group? How strong are they? And how much territory are they now in control of? All right. All of those three questions are uh, questions that we might be unable to answer in this conversation. Um, but what we can tell you is that for the past three years, this group has grown. It's grown in size and it's grown in its ability to, 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 to stage attacks, serious attacks. It started by doing a game of cut and rat with security forces, going to village, attacking civilians, 
destroying property and them running away once security force arrived. They moved into being a serious enemy to security force and even targeting military posts. And what we have seen late, uh, latest in Palma shows that the group is now ready to even stage the type of terror that we have seen in other countries, uh, which, which means arriving in village, uh, making sure that foreigners are in fear, but also putting us in a situation where we don't know where the locals, the people who are originally from Palma, are at this moment. Fernando, what's the latest information we have about the siege? Do we know, for example, how many people remain trapped inside Palma still? Well, uh, as you probably have heard, uh, the information coming out of Palma, uh, it's not uh, uh, really uh, much available. So there, there is a, there, there are ongoing reports. Some of the information needs to be reconfirmed and uh, cross uh, cross checked. Still, uh, Saturday and this morning, there have been uh, very successful. Uh, operations to uh, rescue people, especially uh, people affiliated with uh, with uh, with companies, since they have more institutional ties, and then uh, uh, there are also uh, more organized support for uh, these people. In relation to uh, citizens uh, living there, plus uh, thousands of refugees from uh, the district of Nangat and other uh, localities uh, uh, around. The, the situation is, uh, is very bad. It is known that the people uh, got uh, trapped in a bush. Uh, some others are now reaching Afunji. Afunji is where the total uh, camp is located and people feel uh, safer going to the total camp. It is estimated at this point there are about 20,000 people that reach, uh, reach Kitunda. Kitunda is a, a village next to the total uh, camp, and these are uh, uh, local citizens fleeing from, uh, from Palma. Uh, it's not also clear mm -hmm. what is the operational system situation in military terms in Palma, but uh, according to the last reports, there were still ongoing fight in, in Palma mm. between uh, uh, jihadist insurgents and the Mozambican army. Jasmine, what does an attack of this scale say about the level of coordination among the fighters behind it? And does this come at all as a surprise considering how much the situation has worsened in the past few years? I think it leaves, uh, for someone that has been following the insurgency in great detail, highly frustrated. And I'll tell you why. For the last two years, we've warned that there are some influences within the insurgency at play. There are people with clear, deep level experience in guerrilla warfare fighting that has been transmitted back into Cabo Delgado. We've warned that Mozambique prior's occupation for a prolonged period gave them the ideal opportunity not only for training but for recruitment. The attack itself should never have taken place. This is the tragedy of Palma because they were, there was early warning provided, and I tweeted that specifically. Uh, and the question has to be raised why no action was taken. But sadly, as we've seen the last three years, um, we, the Mozambican government security forces are simply not in a position for various reasons. And I'm not going to go into all of them now, but they simply cannot stand up um, or, or counter. If we now talk about Palma, yet another defensive operation, Yet another crisis management trying to get as many people out of there as possible. Mm -hmm. And now, mm -hmm. with the attack, when the insurgents, and please I want to confirm what the previous speaker has said, keep in mind facts a problem. We're working with, uh, I call it hot information. As they come in, you look at your sources, you try to determine reliability. But according to the reports at hand, uh, insurgents also started running out of bullets. 
they merely brought in uh, extra insurgents, extra arms, mm. and ammunition. And that tells you where we stand with the insurgency. And that is the concern. And I am afraid that the U.S. designation has oversimplified this insurgency mm -hmm. to suit specific mm -hmm. agenda, to suit militarization, to suit a war on terror. And if anyone thinks mm -hmm. that two months training mm -hmm. is going to make a difference, I've got some bad news for them. It is needed, but the time is not on our side, and sadly, time is what we need. Zaneda, didn't the government of Mozambique declare just around a week ago that Palma was relatively safe. Uh, what's happened? How did this happen? It's not just about the fact that Palma was relatively safe, as they said, but it's also the fact that many people who are running away from other areas surrounding Palma that are being attacked tend to seek refuge in Palma. So Palma was full not only of soldiers, uh, people, uh, expatriates, but also refugees from other places. So one will ask, how is it possible for a town that was heavily guarded, uh, like Jasmine explained, that everybody knew could be targeted at any moment for the specificities that we have explained in this conversation. How was it possible for, uh, for this group to enter this town fire indiscriminately, killing people and a number that at this stage we cannot verify how many people died, making people flee to the bush for, their, for, 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 for help. And then there are other questions around that, not just the fact that the government is failing to protect people, but also is failing in their intelligence to, 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 to be able to distinguish between the insurgents and people, genuine refugees that are seeking uh, help. The other question that we keep asking, but not just from Palmer, from mm. other attacks that have taken place in the past three years, is when those attacks happen, where is the army? Where are the soldiers? Why are they never there around to protect people immediately? They only appear once people have already died or they have already run away to seek refuge in, in the bush. People shouldn't be let down to, to go to the bushes and seek help for themselves, let alone be forced to walk for kilometers on their mm. own to reach safety, for example, in Afunju or, or Pemba or, 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 or Mueda or Montequej, which are the places where people are going to. So there are lots of questions that the government needs to answer. It's not just about mm. giving us a press conference in which they are going to tell us how many people died. It's also about explaining what exactly happened, what failed, and what measures they are taking for a situation like Palma not to be repeated ever again. Fernando, I want to ask you about the root causes of this conflict. How much of this is driven by social grievances? I mean, there have been promises of wealth, but poverty and unemployment are still rampant there, correct? Yes, I, I agree with, uh, with, uh, with that view. Uh, but it, this is not just a problem of Cap Delgado. This is a problem of the, 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 the whole country in which uh, there is a large number of, of people that don't have access to opportunities, don't have, uh, have, have access to, to jobs, and this uh, creates uh, grievances. Of course, then on the, top, uh, on the top of it, you have the, the oil and gas uh, projects, and you have uh, a kind of uh, religious uh, justification that uh, gives also uh, fuel uh, to uh, start this, uh, this infighting, because there are serious doubts if this is a really a religious confrontation or there is a, a cover for these grievance, social grievances, and then these are kind of uh, being presented as a, a, religious, uh, a religious crusade, or that ISIS just take uh, the opportunity uh, uh, to uh, fight in Cap Delgado and claim that this is a portion of uh, the ISIS uh, fight in this uh, particular area of, uh, of Africa. But I, I think that the main problem is, in fact, uh, uh, poverty and uh, in, uh, in quality. And unfortunately uh, for the government, they are not been able to pass a message in, in, in order 
to explain people that uh, they are there to re reverse the situation. And of course, mm. this kind of uh, do not understanding what the situation is and uh, I would say a bad management of expectations related to oil and gas because it creates this idea mm. that there are other Mozambicans living in a south that are benefiting from oil and gas. In fact, there is no oil and gas mm -hmm. at, uh, uh, at this point yet. Jasmine, earlier in the show, Zaneda spoke about how much uh, this group, Al Shabaab, had grown in these past few years. How easy has it been for the group to recruit members? Initially, and let's look at the last year to answer your question, otherwise it's going to be a long discussion. But I do, and if one looks at Nampula, if one looks at Nyasa, uh, and if one looks during the period of the occupation of Mozambique prior, it is clear that where there was a perception initially that the fighters are forced into the insurgency, there is also a group that is free willingly joining the insurgent, uh, insurgency or, or the group, Al-Shabaab. And, and I think that's an important point because it does show that there's a voice um, of discontent against government that is finding, finding credibility among specific uh, groups of people. Uh, it seems like we're talking about your more young generation, 20 to 30 to 35, irrespective. But there is definitely a, a, a growth taking place. And if you had to ask me to estimate their strength, and I look at the 19 cells active uh, based on incidents and based on movements, I would say if we're going to say, and it's, uh, it's always dangerous to play with numbers, but I would say if we're going to say these 2,500 insurgents, mm. we are being conservative. Zaneda, you mentioned earlier how dangerous it is for civilians in the area. Now, Human Rights Watch, of course, has documented atrocities committed against civilians, not just by armed groups, but also by security forces. So I want to ask you more specifically, what are the types of abuses being committed against civilians there? One of the abuses is actually related with this inability to distinguish the, 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 the gunmen from this group called Al-Shabaab from uh, uh, the residents and the locals of, of the village that are being attacked. And then that results, for example, in arbitrary detentions, uh, ill treatment of people that are detained. Uh, it results in torture. For example, when they are forcing people who might be innocent to confess to a crime, they use methods that are illegal, that are clear, clear human rights violations. Um, and then there is also the element of uh, uh, summary executions that we have as Human Rights Watch uh, exposed in the past, where, for example, uh, when people uh, do not uh, confess to the crimes they are expected to confess, for example, they are submitted to, subjected to torture that then results in, in killings. Uh, but also uh, the fact that it's problematic that the government to date, in mm. three years of conflict, has not been able to present the public with the numbers of people who have been detained and faced a court of justice. What we have heard from the government officials over and over and over is about how many people they have killed. Well, this is not a competition of who kills most, the government or the insurgents. A government must be ruled by norms, by its own constitutions, and by international laws. In other words, it has to be able to respect human rights, including of those who are detained. Mm. So that, those are some of the abuse that we have seen on the side of the government. But there is one that is particularly worrying that we have seen also happening in Palma since Wednesday, mm -hmm. is their absence in the moment of, of, of danger, in the moment of panic and moment of drama. For example, when we spoke to people on Wednesday, they were telling us about the presence of the, of the group, the gunmen of the group across uh, Palm and, and firing at them indiscriminately. Nobody was able to tell us that the, if there were soldiers explaining people where to mm. go to, if there were soldiers start trying to protect the people on the streets. In fact, the absence of soldiers to help population was very clear. 
And that is an embarrassing for a government like Mozambique that has been fighting this group for the past three years. By now, they should have learned how to help their population and how to lead them to safety in a moment of danger. Fernando, SADC nations had resolved to deal with the security threat posed by the situation in Mozambique. But has there been any visible movement when it comes to implementation of those plans? Well, uh, this is a uh, 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 quite uh, interesting uh, uh, question because, in fact, what we have or what we have learned from the, 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 the past discussions is, is that SADC is trying to, to, to move forward the, the whole issue of uh, the security situation in Cap Delgado and uh, Mozambique providing uh, kind of dubious uh, answers related to, related to that, meaning uh, Mozambique never came up publicly explaining what is their position regarding uh, SADC support. And we see especially South Africa having a more aggressive stance in order to, uh, to, to discuss and debate what kind of role SADC can play in, 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 uh, in Mozambique. So uh, it's not clear uh, uh, this, uh, this, this, this issue, but situations like Palma, it will be uh, forcing uh, Mo uh, Mozambique and the Mozambican uh, government to define what mm. kind of support they want, either by SADC, by European Union, uh, by the Americans, because up to now it seems uh, it seems to me that the only things that the Mozambican government is ready to 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 get is uh, military training mm. plus logistical support, no other kind of support. And of course, a situation like Palma, it will be uh, introduce uh, other uh, type of discussion at the table namely how, to, how Mozambique can uh, answer uh, to this kind of challenges. And of course, uh, Jasmine mm -hmm. already emphasized the nature of this conflict and the shortcomings of the Mozambican army to address this issue. Jasmine, I saw you nodding there, so I want to get your response. But I also want to ask you more specifically, if this conflict continues to get out of hand, to spiral out of control, what are the ramifications for the region? Uh, the Ramifications is already at play. I think we cannot ignore it. I think the Palma incident has shown. Uh, I might just, if I may use 10 seconds, what is interesting about the Palma incident is, and that is the tra tragedy of, 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 of Cabo Delgado, is when expat, expats get targeted, everyone goes crazy. What about the 60,000 people that had to flee and find a home somewhere? quite quickly, or safety quite quickly, be it Mosambuada Praia, Mumueda, be it Mudumbi, wherever. And I think it's a sad case, but, uh, but, but we cannot neglect um, in terms of Cabo Delgado. But let's get back to your question. Uh, the expansion of the conflict itself will not happen overnight that there are railway lines of support cannot be and should not be ignored. But I think the problem we are sitting with is for the longer the insurgency continues, um, the risk to the region increases. The issue of weapons, the issue of sympathy, the issue of IDPs fleeing, uh, the issue of... Um, movement mm -hmm. of, of, organ, of illegal goods. I'm talking about an area where there is simply no governance, mm -hmm. where there is no ability to control anything. But the major issue is the following. Mm -hmm. A $26 billion investment for the region is desperately mm -hmm. needed from an economic perspective. It can benefit. And if it is not going to proceed, the whole mm -hmm. region, from an economic perspective, will feel it. Jasmine, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but we have run out of time. So we're going to have to leave the conversation there. But thanks so much to all of our guests for joining us. Thanks, Zenedo Machado, Jasmine Opperman, and Fernando Lima. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see this and all of our previous programs, again, anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. 
And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.